To continue this conversation about fact and truth and what it all means, can I please call on Kishore Mahbubani, the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew University, to join us here on stage. So, Farid, one of the things you said, well, you said uh, several things. Some of them that you said was that a fact is becoming a victim and the boring truth, and that we need to come back to reality and to know what the, the facts are and what truth is. But how worried are you that we're not going to actually come back to this reality? Look, I'm worried. You look at, you have a situation where, um as I say in the last presidential campaign, you saw this, uh, this almost jujitsu that Trump was able to achieve, where if you remember the phrase fake facts was first used to describe actual disinformation, um, intentionally false information that was being spread maliciously to undermine uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign. For example, the, the, uh, the, um, the fact that the, Hill, the Clinton campaign was running a child prostitution ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington. This was propagated on the internet, and you laugh, but of course keep in mind that it was believed by enough people that somebody went with a gun and tried to, you know, take justice into his own hands. That was what the term fake facts was meant to mean. Trump, in a, as I say, in a brilliant jujitsu, started to then use the word fake fact to describe every article he didn't like. Every time somebody criticized him, he said, well, that's fake news. Now, so all of a sudden now, fake news just is the term used when you don't agree with an article. We have to return to the idea that there are such things as actual fake news, that in fact there was no child prostitution ring at a pizza parlor, and that is, that is fake news. I, wo I worry about it, but I do think at the end of the day, this is such a blatant um, disregard for evidence that it will slowly but surely collapse. I think that, you know, people are using it, and over time, as the, as the, the truth, maybe I'm an enlightenment optimist, but I do believe that the truth will win out. It, it will not win out immediately, and it will not win out if we do not take it as, as an urgent task to make it win out. It will, there's no natural force that's going to make this happen. But I think because of people in this room and people like them around the world, Eventually, uh, you, we cannot live in a world in which there is no, you know, there, there's where black is white and, and, uh, and up is down. That, I mean, it seems like we will have walked into George Orwell's 1984. Kishore, let me bring you into the conversation. Stanford University did a study and looked at whether young people can determine what's fake news on the internet and what isn't. And they found that the majority of young people who were educated can't. They can't decipher between what's fake and what's real. So can you tell me a little bit about what your university is doing and what you as an educator think about that? Um, well, you know, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, we are very privileged that we have a very globalized classroom. But let me begin by saying that I, I'm very happy to be on the panel with Farid, who's an old friend I've known since he was a graduate student in Harvard in 91. And I completely agree with what he said. Uh, but I also want to emphasize one key dimension here, that there's a lot that is happening in the West that is shaking the world. There's a lot that is happening outside the West that is also shaking the world. And it's important to bear in mind, to come to my point about our school, that about 12% of the world's population lives in the West. 88% lives in the rest. And of this 88%, the vast majority live in Asia. And the contrast between what's happening in the West and what's happening in Asia is that in the West, it is a fact. And I think Faris' lecture captured some of it. There's a lot of pessimism about the future. By contrast, if you go to most Asian countries today, there's a lot of optimism about the future. And of course, the 21st, just as the 19th century was a European century, the 20th century 
was the American century. The 21st century will be the Asian century. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wish I could take credit for it. I'm just saying it's going to come. <laughs> I didn't cause it. <laughs> but, you know, by 2050, Price Waterhouse Coopers predicts that the number one economy in the world will be China, number two will be India, number three, United States of America, number four, Japan. Three out of the four top world's economies will be Asian. So the whole nature and chemistry of the world is changing fundamentally. And our challenge as educators is to see how we, in a sense, create education systems that capture the, not the world of yesterday, but the world of tomorrow. And the one, one key point we should all bear in mind as educators is that We've seen more change in the last 30 years than we have seen in the last 300 years or maybe even 3,000 years. And just give you a couple of statistics that illustrate how dramatically the world has changed. In 1970, in terms of absolute poverty levels, was 60% of the world's population. By two years ago, it went down to less than 10%. And nobody noticed. It's amazing. It's an amazing drop in global poverty. The other amazing statistic is that we are living through the greatest explosion of global middle-class populations. In uh, 2010, globally, it was 1.8 billion. By 2020, it's 3.2 billion. By 2030, it'll be 4.9 billion. More than half the world's population will enjoy global middle-class living standards. So we are going through an amazing transformation and we have to capture some of the positive trends and the positive dynamic that is happening because to some extent it is also balancing some of the pessimism uh, that you see in the West. So for example, in our classroom, in the Lee Kuan Yew School, an ideal classroom for us is like 20% from Singapore, 20% from Southeast Asia, 20% China, 20% India, 20% rest of the world. And the students actually say to us that they learn a, quite a bit from the professors but they learn even more from their fellow students who come from different countries and then give them perspectives that they didn't expect to get. So I, one, one solution I therefore feel in this world where we're trying to seek the truth is to create these kinds of multi-civilizational classrooms, multi-civilizational events like WISE, and to say, hey, there are different perspectives. How do we put them all together to see the world as a whole? Yeah. Just, uh, um, Kishore is right, of course, um, but let me point out that even in Asia, uh, you have this return of identity that is taking place. So if you look at whether it's Japan or India, these themes of uh, a certain kind of a, a, a rise of, a, of these, these uh, what perhaps might have been thought of as older forces, the return of some of these cultural national chauvinisms uh, is, is quite strong. And in fact, the leaders who do well in the world today are the leaders who know how to speak to this language of nationalism or chauvinism or sectarianism. It's unfortunate that the, you know, we're, we're, we are at a point where political leadership that is skilled at dividing is working better than political leadership that is skilled at uniting. And in fact, actually, um, in these regimes, they're quite happy to be in a post-world truth. Oh, absolutely. That, that, I mean, I think that's, that's what makes, you know, the, the most powerful uh, problem that you face is that politically, it is hugely advantageous to always be able to construct your own narrative. And technologically, as I said, you have achieved a, a, a reality that people can simply select the channel that they agree with. You know, if you think about it, you know, those of you who are, have administrative or business positions, when you make a decision, one of the most important things you always ask yourself is, what's the best argument against what I'm about to do? What are the strongest counter arguments? How do I consider those issues? Well, as citizens, increasingly, what we are doing is saying we only want to get the information that reinforces our point of view, that reinforces our fact basis. We never want to look at, at things that could in any way contradict or disconfirm. And this is in your job as a citizen, as a civic uh, person, which should be incredibly important. This should be one of the primary areas where you try to take in all the information you can. 
technology makes it possible, political leadership makes it possible, and honestly, human cognitive bias, there's many, many good studies on this. We like confirmation bias. We like hearing things that confirm what we believe. That is what the job of education is, to make us uncomfortable, to make us not fall prey to those kind of confirmation biases. But then we have this toxic mix of social media, for example, where anyone can now go online and, and like you say, you know, make all sorts of accusations against Hillary Clinton, for example, and then someone turns up with a gun. So how do you deal with that? How do you manage that? I mean, do tech companies need to take more responsibility? I think they do, and they're already beginning to. I think that the whole idea that the internet was some kind of you know, nirvana of uh, equal opportunity for everyone is proving to be not the case. What it is is the digital universe is now dominated by five companies uh, that control almost, you know, and when we talk about the digital economy, we are increasingly talking about the economy, not just the economy, but our lives. If you think about how much time particularly children spend with their phone, and you think about how much control that pr pr produces, uh, absolutely, these companies have to take more responsibility. Look, there is no distinction made between truth and falsehood on the web. It's all considered equal. Uh, and if, if these companies do not force themselves to, to in some way get into this business, I think they will also lose uh, some of the allure, some of the kind of uh, ma magic that people have about them. You see it already, YouTube taking down Anwar Awlaki's uh, sermons, which have been pernicious and, and misused for years now, I think that there's going to be more and more of that because otherwise, look, when you type a Google search now, many times your actual search item is number four or five in the search because the people who paid are number one and number two and number three and number four. So that is itself a form of, mis, you know, of untruth or, or misleading. All these issues, I think, are going to have to be dealt with. We are going to have to, I hate to use an old-fashioned word, but we are going to have to... Uh, reassert the hierarchy of knowledge that there are in fact if something is printed in the New York Times it is different from something that is published in a tabloid or a blog post from some anonymous source with no verification that you know there are these distinctions and if if the technological platforms refuse to impose them over time they will lose credibility Kishore, the issues, as, as Farid has just raised, of truth and fact and, and things like alternate facts are debated in the West. Is this something that's of concern uh, in Asia? Well, I mean, I, I would certainly agree with Farid that we, we are entering a world of digital dystopia. <laughs> and I think he's right to highlight this as a problem. But I would say the problem actually gets more complex when you step out of the Western debate. And here, I'm going to say something slightly provocative with apologies to uh, Farid, you know. Uh, he, I agree with him that the New York Times is a great newspaper and certainly there's a greater likelihood of the New York Times being right than virtually any other newspaper in the world. But to just give one concrete example, if you read the New York Times coverage on China, are you getting, in a sense, an accurate version of what's happening inside China? Or are you getting, in some ways, a distorted version of China that is seen through Western spectacles? And here, the story is a bit more complicated because just, just I mean, the facts are, of course, all correct. But if you are, a, let's say, a regular reader of the New York Times, you would, you would begin to believe that at some point in time, this Chinese Communist Party of China cannot last. Communist parties are dinosaurs from the past. They will disappear. They will not survive. And, and that may well happen. But what's remarkable, actually, is the resilience of the Chinese Communist Party and how, actually, it has overcome many internal challenges and become so strong that it now has the capacity to bring, lead, carry Chinese, China forward in a very significant and dramatic fashion. And that's by internal... Uh, uh, transformations, uh, they've created a remarkable meritocracy within the Chinese Communist Party. They've managed to eradicate corruption. They've managed to create a very strong leadership. So it's not perfect, but it's not the one that you might get from reading uh, the New York Times. So I think one, one of the qualifications I would make is that 
in the world of tomorrow, when you're going to have successful societies and civilizations from other cultures, we have to learn to step into their shoes and to see how they see themselves. And by the way, Farid is absolutely right when he says... Can I, can I bring in Farid into yeah. this? Because often the Western media gets accused of distorting how Asia is uh, represented, just as Kishore has, has said. So do you agree then, perhaps, that we in the West, Western media, the BBC, CNN, and big publications, look at countries like China through Western spectacles. So we highlight their human rights abuses, for example, um, and not look at the other positive aspects. I think this is a very difficult and complicated subject because it mixes together two different things. Uh, one is the genuine reality of what Kishore is saying, which is there are cultural differences among all countries, by the way. And particularly, one might say, broadly speaking, between the Judeo-Christian West and the East. But even within the East, of course, there's enormous difference between, say, a Japan and an India. Um, but that's, that's one set of issues. The other are the self-serving arguments that the leaders of many of these countries make to shield themselves from criticism, uh, and, uh, which is then wrapped up in, in the garb of cultural differences. So, for example, it is only in the New York Times that you would have read that key members of the Chinese Communist Party who lead the country have amassed billions and billions of dollars uh, in their own personal net worths through a series of highly corrupt and often illegal schemes. That, that news was not reported in any culturally sensitive Chinese newspaper, or else the editor would have been executed. Right? Uh, that, in, that information is only provided by publications like the New York Times. There are many such examples of things that Leaders in the, in the East will use as saying, don't, don't, you know, don't uh, trespass on our culture, when in fact what they're saying is, let me continue to oppress my people uh, without, without uh, regard. And then one final point, one final point, we all live in the shadow of the domination of the West, intellectually. Look, this, this conference, all of you, we are all in many ways shaped by that reality. The, the founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, and I had a very long session when I was editing foreign affairs, and I spent hours and hours with him and interviewed him. And he used to make this case that there was a big difference between Chinese culture and Western culture. And at the end of our interview, he says to me, Farid, I still don't think I've convinced you. Let me try to explain to you the essential difference between Chinese culture and Western culture. And he gives me a book. And he says, if you read this, you will understand it. And there's a book on China by John Fairbank, an American scholar. So when the leader of Singapore is trying to understand Chinese culture, he goes to a Harvard professor whose name is John Fairbank, who is the leading authority on Chinese culture in the world. You know, we're all mixed up. And, we can, and I think the important thing to understand is, of course there are differences, but we can all understand each other. It is not impossible. Just as Lee Kuan Yew used John Fairbank to teach himself about the Chinese culture that, that he wanted to, we can, we can all learn from each other. And that's again why what you are doing and what Sheikh Hamza is doing is so important because education can bridge even that cultural, that great cultural divide. And we've just got a few more minutes before I open this up uh, to the floor uh, for some questions. So I'll come back to you, Kishore, and the issue of education and how what kind of advice can you give schools, students, the educators sitting here about how to navigate now in this post-truth world? Well, I would say that this is where I actually am going to agree with uh, Farid. But just, just a quick comment. Uh, I agree with him. It is there are things that the New York Times can report on China that, frankly, you can't get reported in China. But there are things that are happening in China which are also not reported. That's the nuance uh, I want to add. But let's to go back to what you teach the young people. Uh, and, and here I agree with uh, Farid on the importance of Western liberal education. Because I myself, I studied Western philosophy uh, in university. And it was the constant questioning that Western philosophy taught me that ironically enabled me to ask the sort of questions uh, that I'm asking. So I would say, going back to the uh, comparison, the, the, the point that uh, Farid made in his, his speech, where he said when we have all these things, information coming at us and deciding how to sift through it, deciding facts from non-facts, we actually have to go back to the basics of liberal education, uh, 
and learn the art of questioning and challenging uh, everything. And that's actually is something that's going to become even more important uh, in the world of tomorrow because we're going to l live in a much more complex and nuanced world where you will get different points of view thrown, of you, thrown at you from either from the debates within the West or frankly, or debates within the West and the rest. There'll be all kinds of debates. Trying to figure out what's right and wrong requires us to go back to the basics. And I think basically, the way the human being will, at the end of the day, complement the computers that Farid spoke about, you know, the computers will give us far more information. But how we, in a sense, take a step for away from computers' knowledge is to ask fairly basic questions. How will this apply to human lives? How will human lives become better or not better? And that's why we still have to go back to the fundamentals. On that note, I'd like to open up the floor uh, to some questions. We'll have uh, some people going around with microphones and uh, we'll take three or four questions because we are uh, short on time. And if I can please ask you to keep your uh, questions and comments very brief uh, for our panelists. Thank you, Fareed and Kishore, good friends. Um, first of all, I want to commend you both policy wonks to give such credence to culture. Thank you. Um, the question I have is actually something that Farid, you mentioned and something you sure what you said, which has to do with the difference in the young people and how they're thinking of the future. We know from much of the studies done in the West that especially in America, young people are quite pessimistic about their future compared to how people feel, young people feel about that, especially in India or China, because of the aspirational quality of the, their future would be better. How do you think the idea of fake news and post-truth world actually would resonate, and is there a difference between how young people in Asia are actually accessing information? Because my sense is that they're not different in terms of how they're accessing that social information. But does the aspiration make a difference in how they're thinking about their world and how they access facts? Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll take one, um, I believe, number one up there. A very good morning to all of you. I am uh, Vanch Saluja. I am part of the Wise Learners Voice Program. So I have a question uh, for uh, Mr. Farid. Uh, I wish to ask you as young people and uh, as we are part of the Learners Voice, we uh, are trying to represent the voice of young learners across the world. Uh, I wish to ask you, this was a point which was raised in the debate as well, that we have a lot of young educated people who themselves are not being able to like uh, decide as to whether some news is fake news or real news. So before I, I was coming to uh, Qatar, for example, we had local uh, media houses in India which were reporting that the supermarkets are closed, the, there's, there are no medical supplies in Qatar, but when we come here, it's completely different. And the perception uh, that, we, that is being built in, uh, for example, in national media in India is very different from what we see here in Qatar. So I'm sure that this is something which is happening all across the world. So how, as young people, we, divide, we, we, we uh, assess as to whether something is fake news or the truth? Okay, thank you. And uh, number two there. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Shakil Ahmed Kakwi, Chairman of Kainath Foundation. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Farid. Like, uh, as the young people, those who are getting confused about their career by searching the nets in the news, like especially in the field of the education, because they're not much interested to become the teacher, and the teacher's sons are not joining as the teacher, and there's a, uh, there's a, there's a gap and they wanted to search in all other fields and one side uh, being the, this uh, wise conference where we are working and talking about the innovation in education. So there's a gap between this inspiration in the young people to join for the education field as a teacher. Okay, thank you very much. Lots of questions about young people. I might just bring it back to uh, the panel. So we've, we're hearing a lot of uh, questions there about how young people can grapple with uh, understanding what's going on uh, online. So Fari, do you think that this digitally native generation are actually digitally naive? Oh, I think that's very well put. I, I think that young people are incredibly naive about, uh, about 
you know, the, the, the nature of the world. Uh, they, they access it now in sound bites, in tweets. Uh, obviously, tweets are not being used just by young people. Um, there's a certain 71-year-old man who's use, using it a great deal. Um, but in general, there, you know, there is an inherent superficiality to all this. One of the problems, I, look, I say this to my kids all the time, is you, you can graze all these little headlines and tweets and blog posts as you like. At the end of the day, the way you develop real knowledge about a subject still remains that you have to go deep, still remains that you have to actually read books, still remains that you have to talk to experts, you have to travel to countries. Somehow, magically, the human brain is not becoming very smart because you're, you're reading tweets. You know, we haven't, that, 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 the brain hasn't sort of been rewired in that way. And so all you do is you put yourself at a competitive disadvantage if you don't, if you don't handle these things. I, th I think this is one of the great challenges we face. And look, I don't mean this in a way to suggest that I'm in any way you know, putting down young people or anything like that. I, I think about myself. I grew up in India with no television. Um, in television came to India about 1975. I was 10 years old. One channel, black and white, they would show documentaries about the glories of Indian agriculture which meant nobody watched, okay? There was one Bollywood movie on Sunday nights and we would watch that. Um, I read voraciously because that was what you could do. If I had a supercomputer in my pocket called an iPhone that could stream all the entertainment in the world, all the movies, all the television shows, I don't think I would have read that much, but I don't think I would have had the career that I have, you know? So I don't know where that takes you, but I, had, I think at some level, Children are going to have to learn something that maybe I didn't have to learn as much, which was discipline, intellectual discipline, the ability to say no, right? I mean, the, the, the world I grew up in, uh, there, were, there was no choice. You know, if I, if I went to a store, you could buy one thing. The world my children are growing up in, it is exactly the opposite. The problem is a kind of explosion of choice, an explosion of options, an explosion of opportunity. And part of education has to be teaching them how to turn things off, how to shut things down, how to focus, how to concentrate. Those weren't things you had to do as much in the 1960s and 70s, but you do today. And Kishore, do you have something to add to that, including a response to that question uh, about the differences between the West and, and Asia, how they access information, and why perhaps uh, in a uh, the West they're far more pessimistic than Asia? Well, I think, um, I, by the way, like, I'm much older than Farid. <laughs> I also grew up in the free much, yeah. you know, television era. And like him, I read lots of books, and I say, agree that that's wonderful. But at the same time, I also know I was privileged because... I had access to a public library and therefore I could read books. But what I think the other, the other thing to bear in mind about social media is that social media actually has empowered lots of young people, especially in Asia. And one country I will give as an example is Indonesia. If I'm not you know, Indonesia has always been one of the relatively poor developing countries as per capita income has been much lower than Brazil's and so on and so forth. But today, Indonesia, I think, has the third largest number of Facebook users on, on planet Earth. And I'm sure some of it is being used for frivolous stuff. But some of it is also being used to gain access to information that you could never get before. And to give an obvious example, uh, you know, as a, as a child, I could never afford to own an encyclopedia. Today, all of us who have access to a smartphone can get access to Wikipedia. And then through Wikipedia, you get access to information that you could never get uh, before. And I actually think that to some extent, the social media users in Asia, that's my uh, impression so far, use this also to get a lot of information on what's happening uh, around the world, trends and so on and so forth. And in the case of Indonesia, one thing that I'm heartened by is that a friend of mine, who was the former Indonesian uh, ambassador to Washington, D.C., uh, organized the world's largest foreign policy conference in Jakarta a few weeks ago, and I spoke at a conference of 7,000 young people. And he said the main mission of this conference is to fight xenophobia, to fight nationalism, and to open, minds, open the minds of people to, to more sort of open trends that are happening in the world. And what was the instrument he was using? Social media. So the social media, I guess, is a double-edged sword. It can be used by some people 
to, to flood your minds with disinformation. But if you are talented and you can use it well, you can also use it to balance and, and fight these forces. And that's why, for example, I, if you ask me about the countries that I'm most optimistic for in the next 10 to, 10 to 20 years, very people are surprised when I say Indonesia. Indonesia is one of the most undiscovered, uh, unappreciated countries in the world. It should be subject to all kinds of dark and dismal trends. It's gone through enormous crisis, but it has an incredibly bright future. That's I, remarkable. I second that. I spent some time there last year, and uh, I definitely agree with you. We've unfortunately run out of time for this session, but I... Uh, I think you both summed up the pros and cons of social media and what I found actually, what I'll walk away from this session is that to go back to basics, to pick up a book, to go back to education, to, to learn, uh, to absorb things uh, in, in uh, those ways uh, rather than just totally relying on social media and what's on the internet as well. So thank you both for a fantastic panel and for all your analysis. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you so much, for sure. Thank you. I wish you a thought-provoking and inspiring few days here at WISE. Enjoy it and thank you. And can I please thank Her Highness, as well as our guest of honor, Her Excellency, the First Lady of Turkey. Thank you.